Have you ever believed something to be true only to find out later that you were completely wrong? Today, we're going to be diving deep into the fascinating world of research on schizophrenia, and I promise what I have to share is going to blow your mind. In fact, as I was reading the study, I couldn't believe it myself, and it's making me wonder if we just have it all wrong. The study we're going to look at today is the Vermont Longitudinal Study. It looked at the long-term outcomes of 262 patients who were diagnosed with schizophrenia in the mid-1950s, and it followed them for about three decades, so this is a very long study. And what makes this study so intriguing is that many of these patients experience significant improvement and even recovery without medication, defying our traditional beliefs about schizophrenia treatment. Many of them were able to live normal lives and were entirely off their medication or just used it on an as needed basis. Now, when I read this study, I thought, okay, maybe they cherry picked the research subjects. Maybe they found the patients at the state hospital who they thought would do best upon discharge. And they're like, you know what? We'll, we'll take little Timmy over there. We'll take Rebecca. She seems to be doing pretty good. We'll take Thomas. I think he's going to have a good discharge. And maybe because they cherry picked the patients, we are seeing better results than we otherwise would, right? And maybe the patients they picked had only a mild form of schizophrenia. But look, the reality is I was wrong. They didn't cherry pick. The patients were described as middle-aged, poorly educated, lower class individuals individuals further impoverished by repeated and prolonged hospitalizations. These were people who were patients at the Vermont State Hospital, and they were chosen because of their chronic disability and resistance to treatment. So my hunch was actually backwards. These were the patients probably least likely to succeed after discharge, and they certainly appeared to have at least mild to moderate severe mental illness. So some of you might be thinking, well, 260 some patients in the 1950s were diagnosed with schizophrenia, but maybe decades later when the DSM went through heavy revision, maybe these 200 some patients didn't meet diagnosis diagnostic criteria. So maybe the patients didn't really get better. The benchmark for schizophrenia just changed and how we define schizophrenia change and the diagnostic criteria were different in the 1980s than they were in the 1950s. I think this is a very valid point and a question we need to explore. Luckily for us, the researchers did take this into consideration. And so 269 of the patients who were diagnosed with schizophrenia by the DSM-1 diagnosis, 118 of them would actually still be diagnosed with schizophrenia based upon the DSM-3 criteria. So in other words, if the researchers could go back to the 1950s and use the DSM-3 criteria, 118 of the patients would have been diagnosed with schizophrenia. From the 118 patients who did meet criteria, researchers were only able to locate 82 of them after about 30 years had passed. So what did the 82 patients look like? Well, about half of them had been hospitalized for more than six years before entering the rehabilitation program. About a fourth of them had been hospitalized for two to six years. About a third of them had been hospitalized for less than two years half were males and half were females. The age range was 41 to 79 years old and the average age was 61 years of age, meaning that at the start of the study for these 82 subjects, the average age was about 30 years old in the 1950s. Considering that about half of these patients had been hospitalized for more than six years should give us some evidence as to the degree of their mental stability. So let's take a deeper look at these 82 patients in regard to their medication. 84% of them had some sort of psychotropic medication prescribed to them. 75% of them were prescribed a low to medium dose range, which is great to see because even if they needed medication, which a lot of them didn't and were taking it as prescribed, they were on lower doses than we would expect from patients discharged from a long-term state hospital. We also can deduce from these numbers that at least 84% of them were seeing a prescriber on a regular basis, else they wouldn't have active prescriptions of psychotropic medication. So it's not as though these patients were just discharged and were not seeking any sort of routine care, they were definitely going to see their mental health provider on a regular basis. Now, here's where I think the numbers get super interesting. Of the 84% of patients who were prescribed medication, about 25% of them took it as prescribed. Another 25% self-medicated whenever they had symptoms, so they were using their meds on an as-needed basis, and the remaining 34% didn't take any medication at all. No medication whatsoever. So if we add this 34% to the other 16% 
40% of patients who weren't prescribed any sort of medication whatsoever, we can see that 41 patients or 50% of the total weren't taking any medication at all. That's pretty crazy, right? Most of us have been led to believe that schizophrenia is a chronic lifelong condition with a uniformly poor prognosis. However, this study shatters that myth, revealing that a majority of the patients actually got better without medication. And I know this finding is both surprising and controversial as it kind of forces us to question the role of medication in the treatment of schizophrenia. And we have to entertain questions like, well, what if, at least long term, maybe medications actually make schizophrenia worse? What if medication long term isn't really necessary? These are just two questions given the study that we definitely cannot rule out. And maybe instead of bombarding patients with medication after medication and medication on top of medication to address side effects, maybe a more personalized approach, including treatment, therapy, lifestyle changes, support from loved ones, things like that might lead to better outcomes for patients diagnosed with schizophrenia. But let's take a step back. Let's be a little skeptical here. Our sample size is pretty limited. After all, the patients came from one state hospital in Vermont. So how do we know that in this study with a small sample size of 82 patients, how do we know that's indicative of people diagnosed with schizophrenia, perhaps in other geographical locations or maybe in other countries? What I'm trying to say here is that maybe there's something about the crisp Vermont mountain air or the majestic scenery of Vermont that somehow transformed these patients over time. And to be fair here, probably some of the patients actually moved out of Vermont. So maybe Vermont has nothing to do with it. But at the start of the study, they were all located in Vermont. But okay, we just want to make sure that this 41 patients who weren't taking medication whatsoever is actually representative of a broader population of people diagnosed with schizophrenia. How can we rule that out? Maybe these 41 patients are completely different. It's the luck of the draw. It's really not a big number, right? Well, fortunately for us, the Vermont longitudinal study isn't the only research that suggests a more complex picture of schizophrenia treatment. Both the World Health Organization's International Pilot Study of Schizophrenia and the Chicago Follow-Up Study have shown that patient outcomes can vary significantly. Both of these studies indicate that factors aside from medication may significantly impact recovery, such as social support and the degree to which individuals with schizophrenia participate in social, occupational, and community activities. So it's not as though the Vermont study is an isolated research project. There are at least a few other studies that might make us question the usual trajectory and treatment of schizophrenia. And while medication may be beneficial for some people with schizophrenia, the Vermont study suggests that eh, it might not always be the best path for recovery for everyone. And it makes us curious about the potential drawbacks to medication, such as long-term side effects and the possibility that the medication is actually exacerbating some patient's condition over time. Medications used to treat schizophrenia like Haldol's, Iprexa, Risperidone, Seroquel, Abilify, Clozeril, all have long-term side effects and many of them are actually horrible. So horrible that they might actually counteract any benefit or any perceived benefit the person with schizophrenia may receive from taking these medications. And if you're interested in what some of these long-term side effects are, I've discussed many of them in other videos that I have on antipsychotic medications. I also want to remind everyone that when the companies that make antipsychotic medication test to see if the drugs actually help with schizophrenia, their testing usually only lasts a few weeks, even though many people who take these medications are going to be on them for many years. So just because a drug may help someone with schizophrenia for a few weeks, assuming the pharmaceutical companies are telling us the truth about their drug trials, wink, wink, that doesn't mean that the drugs are going to help people for months or years to come. So in my opinion, the Vermont study really highlights the need for more research to understand the full scope of medications impact on patients long term outcomes in regard to their schizophrenia. Along a similar vein, I do want to point out that despite the Vermont study showing schizophrenia medication may not be as valuable as we may like to think it is in the long term, the study is just one piece of the puzzle and more research is needed to determine whether the findings of the Vermont study hold true for a broader population. However, we have to acknowledge the study's results have significant implications for how we view schizophrenia and its treatment. And aside from the whole medication thing, I think one of the best things about the study is it reminds us, hey, the prognosis for schizophrenia isn't as uniformly bleak as we once thought, and there might even be other ways and other roads and other paths to recovery beyond medication, including considering alternative treatments or even maybe no medication at all. I also feel like in this video, I should probably point out that anyone taking medication for schizophrenia or any mental condition like depression or bipolar or whatever, if you decide to come off your medication, please talk with your prescriber about it and make sure you come off your medication very slowly. It's essential to have a supervised gradual taper to minimize withdrawal symptoms and to ensure your own safety. All right. So I just want to get that out there for anyone who's like, hey, some dude on YouTube.
YouTube just told me I don't need my meds for schizophrenia. I'm just going to decide to quit them cold turkey today. That's not what I'm saying. And that's certainly not what the Vermont study is recommending. And really just after reading the study, I feel like there's so much more we have to learn about schizophrenia, despite the study being done in the 1980s. It's not as simple as like, hey, just take this antipsychotic medication, take these sedatives, and you're going to feel better. That might be true for some people in the short term, but this study clearly shows otherwise for a lot of people. So I hope at a minimum this study has convinced you schizophrenia may go away on its own, or the symptoms may just decrease to the point that someone can have a relatively normal life, and that there are other factors besides medication that help with how this condition plays out. Thanks for watching.